Hello and welcome to Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. We are your hosts, Vidas Pinkavichus and Ushamut Zide Pinkavichin. We've been mastering secrets of organ playing for more than 20 years and sharing them on this blog since 2011. On this show, which we create from our home in Vilnius, Lithuania, we strive to help you grow in every area of organ playing, including practice, technique, repertoire, sight reading, hymn playing, improvisation, composition, music theory, harmony, and many others. Our hope is to help you become a complete musician, or what we call as total organist, a program which we have created to help you reach your dreams faster than you would do on your own. If you are new here, we invite you to subscribe to receive free updates of this blog at organduo.lt. By subscribing, you will also receive free video on how to master any organ composition and 10-day organ playing mini chords. And now let's go to the podcast for today. So, I'm uh, at the church of uh, St. Casimir's in Vilnius right now. And uh, I'm very delighted uh, to introduce to our listeners from around the world, from 89 countries, Professor uh, Martin Zander from Germany, who is a professor of organ at the Hochschule für Musik in Detmold and at the Hochschule für Musik in Basel. Uh, we're meeting here because uh, uh, of the occasion uh, of... Uh, of the 8th International Cirlonis Piano and Organ Competition, where Professor Zander is a um, member of the jury. And um, uh, we are talking now in between of the second round and the final round. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's Thursday, uh, November 14th, and uh, on Friday, November 15th, will be the finals in another city. So I'm very delighted uh, to, to be able to welcome um, Martin Zander in our conversation. Thank you so much, and welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Professor Martin Zander, Zander I will continue his biography a little bit, uh, because... Uh, uh, we talked about his research and background, and he's a very fascinating person. Um, he conducted numerous master classes in Germany, many European countries, Russia, the USA, and Asia. And he studied in Hanover with Ulrich Bremsteller. He was the winner of several major competitions, such as the international competition, competition of the uh, our ARD in Munich, the International Johann Sebastian Bach competition in Leipzig, and the organ competition of the Prague Spring Festival. Very famous, uh, several competitions um, in Europe. And um, additionally, he was a laureate of the Musashima, Musashino Tokyo competition and uh, of the Anton Bruckner competition in Linz. He was the guest of numerous musical festivals and played in many important cathedrals and halls as a soloist and with many renowned orchestras. Various German and foreign radio and TV stations recorded many of his concerts and invited him for productions. Many of his CD recordings received awards of the critics. He is the author of several articles on stylistic aspects of organ music and worked in the commissions for several large organ projects. He has been a jury member at numerous international organ competitions. Additionally, he has a doctorate degree in physical chemistry. That's sort of unusual um, combination for the organ, for the organist to have, although I personally know several organists from that field too. So, Professor uh, Zander, what uh, brought you to the organ in the first place? Do you remember your first encounter with the organ? It's very prosaic and maybe it disappoints you. I was playing the piano and, well, there are two aspects. One was that I was uh, very much interested in Baroque music and as the piano, the modern piano is quite far away from the Baroque instruments, 
and I had the opportunity in our church to play the organ, where I thought, well, the organ still is more or less the same as uh, during the Baroque times. So I was very interested to play a more authentic instrument out of my interest for Baroque music. And the second reason was that our not-so-friendly neighbors always complained about my piano uh, playing. So in the church I was welcome, and that was one more motivation to go to church to practice <laughs> and to reduce my practice at home on the piano to the level my neighbors could stand. Wonderful. Uh, it's really a fascinating story. Do you remember the first organ that you played? Yes, it was a small village. Now it is a part of the city of Göttingen, but at that time when I grew up there it was still a rather small village with a very old church dating from the Romanic period and the organ was by Karl Giesecke, mid-19th century, enlarged by Paul Ott by a Rückpositiv. So it had two very different uh, manuals, uh, one very heavy and with, with a beautiful old sound of 19th century and one very light with a neo-baroque sound of the 20th century and uh, that organ really was very important for me because playing on these two very different manuals, trios, after that other organs did not frighten we which had slightly different manuals because that was, was so much different. I know what you mean uh, because trio sonatas for example or other trio compositions uh, of the Baroque uh, period uh, are uh, extremely uh, important to coordinate hands and feet and uh, on, on keyboards which, which are either sensitive or too sensitive or are unequal uh, like in some organs it's very difficult and if you manage to do that on that instrument you have no problems on the other instruments. If you are forced to do from the beginning somehow that is the normal thing for you uh -huh. and so I was quite lucky uh, just with this organ. You know, people sometimes uh, start playing with electronic organs and that's their uh, background, that's their normal situation. And then when they start playing the pipe organ, it's, it's frightening, uh, heavy track um, action sometimes, it's, it's too difficult to play, right, with couplers. Um, so you're, yes, you're lucky to have started with the real pipe organ right away. And also that it was with one heavy manual, uh -huh. because uh, playing on a light manual all the time and then coming to a heavy manual, that is really uh, yeah, almost impossible to play well. The other way around is much easier. When you are already trained and you get to a lighter manual, it's no problem. Exactly. It's, it's like uh, walking underwater, much easier, although no. With physics, I'm not sure, but you are with chemistry. Uh, we will talk about that. Walking on water was not my special field. <laughs> I am unable to contribute much to that. But by the way, yes, uh, which came first, organ or uh, chemistry for you, physical chemistry? Uh, well, I played the organ already when I went to school, so at that time, obviously, there was no study in physical chemistry, but my first university uh, studies were indeed in the field of chemistry. Mm -hmm. The specialization for physical chemistry also in the studies comes later, of course, then you start. But you already have started playing the organ yes. in, in uh, earlier times, right? So, so you probably had a fascination with the chemistry world or physical world uh, uh, early on, too. Well, it was mostly physics. physics uh, the chemi yeah. chemics, uh, uh, chemistry came only uh, as part of my uh, studies. Uh, yes, I was always very interested to... I was always very curious and uh -huh. finding out a small little detail of how our world works, a detail which nobody else until that time knew. That was for me a fascination and it's still. And the organ is really, really a really physical instrument, right? You, you had so many technical details, and um, uh, which which are part of the physical world and phenomenon. And uh, some organs don't take um, any, don't have any curiosity into how the organ works, how the tone is produced, uh, right? But people like you, for example, I, I bet 
uh, you you have keen interest in in the mechanics of the instrument, right? Yes, but I don't think that is in any way a decisive, mm -hmm. because. Any good musician is interested in how to produce his tones, if it is a singer who is interested in how his voice works, or if it is any other instrumentalist, that interest must be there, otherwise he won't get very far. So that is nothing special for somebody with a scientific education. Talking about chemistry and physical chemistry, do you remember uh, what your dissertation was about at that time? It was about very short time, which at that time meant uh, sub-picosecond investigations on the ionization, on the photoionization of pure liquids. So basically I, I was shooting a laser into pure water, alcohols, alkanes, and uh, was, time, was doing time-resolved spectroscopy on what resulted, and what did result was pairs of free electrons and what was left over after the free electron was shot away, the positive ions, and then I could follow the kinetics of how they recombined. From that I could deduce some information about the mechanisms how the ionization took place. I see. So that was my work. I see. A uh, very remote area for my Experience. For everybody, of course. <laughs> Because I, if I've done, with, uh, I haven't done any chemistry since the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but I bet uh, when you look at organ pipes, for example, you probably are um, uh, able sometimes to think uh, about the alloys, right? Uh, how metal alloys, how the pipe is uh, m uh, more. more molded, right, or um, from which metals they are made and which uh, percentage of the tin and, 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 uh, and uh, lead are in each pipe. Maybe there is a misunderstanding which is very common. Uh, somebody educated in one field uh, is supposed to, to know also much more about the whole field than the average population, which is not really true. I don't know much about metal alloys. That uh -huh. was not my field. I see. So I know what it is and I know about the processes of oxidation and of uh, tempering, but this is not not much more than everybody can read in half an hour. So, <laughs> so you mainly uh, were focused with ionization? Right. Yes, that is when you specialize in mm. some field, then you really get very deep into one very narrow niche and everything around is, is not so deep. If we translate this wisdom or insight into the organ area, is it uh, acceptable today to specialize in the organ world, for example, to get really deep into one historical period or one even composer? Or, see, or, or even uh, one genre, something like that. You see, those who do, among whom I, I do not really uh, count myself, although I'm, well, the, the, the field I have gone the deepest, I think, is Max Reger, mm -hmm. but uh, still I'm not really a narrow specialist. I try to be universalist, but those who really dug very deep into one field, like Harald Vogel for North German Baroque music. They are sought after experts, yeah. and so this is not only acceptable, but we need these people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To, to learn from them, from, from their thoughts. Of course, they are all not that old that they could have asked the original masters, but their insight after decades of interest for that field is, of course, much more than those who don't specialize that much uh, can have uh, as insight for themselves, so, so they ask. <laughs> We ask those people. You're right. Uh, and uh, since we're living now in the, what, in the third decade, almost in the mm -hmm. third decade of the 21st century, um, basically in this time, um, majority of um, 
mainstream mainstream uh, historical periods of organ composition have already been researched, right? On uh, North Germany, Italy, Netherlands, and uh, France, and uh, uh, Portugal, Spain, England, right? Those schools of organ compositions uh, uh, are quite well known to us. So if anybody uh, today starting out their own research would uh, do uh, their own focus on one of the mainstream areas, I think uh, this, uh, this wouldn't be very easy in today's terms. Uh, on the one hand, you are of course right. On the other hand, there's an interesting phenomenon. Each time sees earlier times through its own glasses. So what we know, or think to know, now about earlier periods has a certain bias which we are not really aware of. We are always aware of the bias those before us had, but our own biases are unbeknownst to us. Only the next generation will find out, oh, that was your thinking influenced from your times, but it was not like it was original. They will have their bias too. So it is always worthwhile to, to think about this anew and anew. And also one has to say, brilliant works, brilliant books, after they have been written, after they have been read for one decade, maybe two decades, go into the library shelves and are more or less forgotten until 200 years later when people start to search for historical sources. Mm -hmm. So yes, it takes decades probably to, to um, for our generation to go to come into the historical um, meaning and, uh, and and context, right? Because right now we are living uh, and, and in the middle of, of the uh, living situation, we cannot really see outside the box. Right, uh, in maybe 20, 50 years, some, somebody after, after us will be able to see all our in influences, as you say, and uh, discover some new ideas what, which were uh, part of our um, worldview. Yes. Excellent. So, Professor Zander, um, how many times have you been visiting Vilnius so far? <laughs> The first time was still during Soviet times. It was uh, secretly. <laughs> we were not allowed to leave the railway station when I went by train to St. Petersburg, at that time still Leningrad. But so I didn't see any police around, so I went out and I walked four hours through Vilnius. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the, the day after, when I told that to my hosts in Leningrad, they uh, were in horror because the day before I came here there was a big demonstration for independence and four people were shot dead. So definitely that was quite a dangerous date of what I was completely not aware. So that was my first visit to Vilnius and wow. afterwards I have been here for three times. Yes. During peaceful and nice times. Isn't that great that we can talk frankly and openly about those things and about those days and uh, travel wherever we want, across the city or country, across EU, without any passport control? For me, it's still a wonder. I grew up 30 kilometers from the inner German border, mm -hmm. and I remember that together with my friends, we often made bicycle tours just uh, to, to watch the soldiers there at the border and uh, have a very bad feeling about it <laughs> and wishing that someday this border would disappear and so it has disappeared. It's, it's really still a wonder for me who, who has grown up during the times when to visit my grandparents I had to pass a strictly controlled border. And exactly, I think 30 years ago, Berliner uh, wall, uh, wall has collapsed, right? Uh, uh, on November 9th, I think. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we are talking about November, what, 14 now? So it's just a week ago that we had the celebration, mm. also in Vilnius, too. Uh, they had a recital, not recital, a concert, concert yeah, yeah. in a big... Uh, big rock concert, I saw yes, the yes. posters. Yes, so free world now, hopefully will stay <laughs> for a long time uh, in our, in our uh, area and people will be able to play the organ among other things, right? 
So, um, uh, how is your impression about uh, this year's um, organ competition? I think uh, uh, I've been a witness of this competition for a number of times now, uh, but uh, I can say that the level of competitions, competitors, contestants is re gradually increasing, and uh, it's really hard to decide who will pass to the next round. For me. Well, for for me, uh, it's it's the same impression. There was nobody really weak. Uh -huh. They were all good, I have to say, uh, whom we heard. Of course, there were differences, and as far as I can judge from the little bit we know of the results, everything here is uh, done in such a way that we are not influenced by, by the opinions of others, so we don't know how anybody else has voted, we don't even know the voting results per name of the competitor, nice. we know only uh, totally anonymized uh, those uh, results. From that we can see that we are pretty much agreeing on everything. That's very reassuring, and that means that uh, it's not so difficult to, to judge, oh yes, these are really our six finalists now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really great when, when in not a non-anonymous setting, uh, uh, the, the jury uh, were able to, to know who is personally playing, right? Uh, even though you were facing th the altar, for example, uh, you still knew the person's last name, right? Uh, in this setting, it's amazing that uh, you can be quite ob objective and uh, not influenced by, for example, um, insiders' opinions and uh, uh, any politics which sometimes go going on in international competitions, right? So I think that this is a good sign for our competition that the uh, organizers uh, have been able to, uh, to, to put forth those rules of anonymity and judging for judges also objectivity. Yes, yes. And also it's the first time that uh, I was in a jury where it was forbidden to discuss among the jurors the performances and that's really a good thing. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's, that's, uh, because uh, otherwise, if you discuss it, it influences you either in the sense the other one intends or it brings you into an opposition which becomes more extreme than it was before. So it's always an influence which um, does not render the, the genuine result afterwards. So I think they really did a good job of a lot of thinking which must have gone into the system it's worth copying. <laughs> the next step would be to make uh, the uh, scores automatic, uh, sort of, and momentary. When anybody is playing, when, let's say, one piece, like uh, like in the second round, let's say, Cellonis Fugue in C-sharp minor, and after that piece, you press a button and uh, you register your score. And it's, you know, um, out, and you cannot change it, you know. It, would that be a good thing? Not really, because uh, when you hear the first participant, you don't know the organ, you don't know the possibilities, after you have heard four of them, and you have heard four times a sound you don't like so much, then you don't count that as a negative for the first one. If you had to judge only by what you hear first, then the poor first one would get the uh, punishment for everything he cannot change. You have a very important point here. I haven't thought about that because the jury, for example, comes from different countries and uh, some people really haven't seen this Oberlinger organ, for example, before. Uh, ideally, the ju jury members uh, should have uh, an accent, access to this organ for an, an hour or, or more to try it out for themselves and see the possibilities and limitations, ideally. I don't know if you had this chance. No, we didn't. You didn't. We didn't. And, and it's 
It's very unpractical. If seven jury members want to play one hour each, that means a full day. Yes, yes. <laughs> and the participants need the day for their preparation. Uh, yes, and, uh, and I'm talking from the perspective, perspective of a person who has lived here and been to this organ many times mm -hmm. and played and listened to from various places in this church and how it sounds. And uh, even I was in the organ uh, during the second round uh, because I had to uh, uh, help the, uh, the person who was tuning the lead mm -hmm. that they were when we were waiting for the trumpet to, uh, to, to, to be tuned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. So, uh, Professor Zander, where you will be going next after uh, this competition? What is your uh, next project? <laughs> It's again a competition. Also? <laughs> It's in St. Petersburg, uh -huh. the Braudo competition. Uh -huh. uh, so a lot of uh, is going on uh, directly from Vilnius? No, 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 no. First at home, uh, one, one month later. Ah, one month later. No, no, I cannot leave my, stu my students alone for, for so much time uh, in a row. And uh, obviously you will still continue to practice and play recitals, oh, yes. right? Oh, yes, of course. Do you have... Um, At that time, I have no recitals in the immediate future. In the winter times, that's much less. Uh -huh. Obviously, the churches are cold. And I see. Uh, yes. And uh, do you think um, you will be learning some new pieces during this cold period? I'm always studying something mm -hmm. new. I, I try to go on with my own development, so I'm, I'm practicing new things. And why? Can you tell us why? Yeah, the reason that's, you're that's, still... uh, that's what I said. I want to, to continue my own development. Uh -huh. I want to fill up uh, gaps in my repertoire and maybe uh, learn something which, which I had no contact to uh, until now. So I'm it's it's a very great point because uh, people uh, at uh, some uh, some point of their career sometimes they stop learning sometimes they stop being curious about uh, new things and uh, they think they know everything or they limit themselves into some area of expertise and they say everything uh, that they know is comfortable for me and I'm not comfortable with new things and maybe this is for other people but not for me so I'm really uh, happy that you are continuing your you see you see what you describe um, that one at a certain point does not add to one's repertoire need not come out of the feeling of own perfection But it's a very natural process. I already now notice that learning a new piece takes double as much time as it used to take when I was 20. Simply the plasticity of the brain is reduced. You, can do, you cannot do anything about it. So at a certain age, I'm afraid I will not be able to learn new big pieces, small pieces probably, yes, which are below the level I can play, yes, but those at the really high level, I'm afraid I might no longer be able to study such big pieces to the level of performance which I have to demand. But you still will enjoy studying them or listening to them or sight reading to them, right? That's what I hope, yes, mm -hmm, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you do that for a long time, you can, you can basically cheat death for a, for a while because the aging process can be postponed. Yes, that's, that's what people say. Mm -hmm. What science has shown, that, that brain plasticity, although it decreases, uh, still stays higher when you ask from your brain to do something more. Yeah, a brain is like a muscle, and if you keep exercising your yeah, muscle, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it uh, decays slower. With time, it still decays, but uh, um, yes, it, it's worth, worth uh, doing that. Uh, in our uh, area of Secrets of Organ Playing, uh, listeners from 89 countries, a lot of them are senior organists from 65 years and up. Uh, I have students in, in their 70s, 80s, sometimes in their 90s. Mm -hmm. And they still continue to practice. But they write uh, emails to me that uh, that uh, it's not 
easy, it's not fast like it was earlier. And I have to reassure them that probably uh, the most important thing is to have fun at that age, right? Not to be stressful about uh, declining abilities, but to really be grateful what you can do. Would you agree? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. The question is, what is fun? <laughs> that is the most important question, because if fun comes from being able to move people by your playing, that requires a certain level. So you have to achieve that level in order to get that fun. Yes. For everyone, it's, it's different, right? Uh, for everyone, fun means playing uh, for part of him, uh, a chora or choral, or, uh, or a short prelude uh, based on a chant. And that would be enough for a person, right? Uh, f to show f for their friends and family their skills. For others, they want to play in a liturgy and, uh, and be able to... Uh, lead uh, liturgical singing that would be uh, a defini definition of fun <laughs> well yes I think the most important thing for that is that you have yourself the feeling you can give something if you give a good liturgical playing to your congregation this can be highly yeah not funny for you because that's the wrong word no. <laughs> but uh, it can give yourself a lot back Professor Zander, if we, if you could go back in time, for example, when you first started playing the organ, even before you studied um, physical chemistry, what do you have been? What would you change? Would you change anything? Would you do something differently? It's very difficult to say because, in total, I'm very, very happy with how everything worked. My, I, I grew up in a university city. Well, as a city, as a small city or a big town, Göttingen, and with tens of thousands of uh, well-educated, culturally interested people in that city, there were possibilities and, and a climate uh, that, that I, I would not find anywhere else. So that was very lucky. And I was, uh, my, my first organ teacher was a brave cantor of, the, of one of the two main churches of Göttingen. And I, I had a very good start with him. And at a certain point, which I also find, uh, which, which shows a great personality, at a certain point he sent me on to a professor to Hanover when he said now I could learn more from somebody else. And so I went to Ulrich Bremsteller already during uh, my school times for private, and I would not change anything about that. I, it was always a pity for me that during to the parallel studies in chemistry and in music, they threw me out of the church music program <laughs> <laughs> because I could not attend everything as it was planned in the study plans. So I would have needed more time to, to, to do everything. So that threw me out of that. And I could only play organ as a solo program. I, I then studied organ and piano on the level what we called Ausbildungsklassen. Today it would be the master's degree, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but not church music. I very much regretted that. But at that time, I was not ready to give up science. And, well, now I'm not doing any science anymore, but I wouldn't miss it in my life either. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I cannot say that there are principal things I would change in that, except for trying harder to be able to continue the church music program. I see. Yeah, if this is something you really love and enjoy, and, and if somebody uh, takes away from you, at least temporarily, it, uh, it is a, a pain, right? And you have to later compensate with something else. Well, it also made it very difficult for me to become a professional musician, because as a soloist organist alone, uh, nobody is interested in you. You have to have a post of a church organist normally in order to play your own concerts, to invite other people, to get invited. And for me it was very hard to become a professional organist and to, to play 
I was invited due to my competition prizes to several universities to, to hold master classes there. And that was the way how, how I began teaching and then in the end really also got the professor's job at Heidelberg Kirchenmusikhochschule. So finally I got on that track, but it was extremely hard, I must say. So those challenges that uh, don't uh, defeat us makes us uh, stronger, right? In yeah, I, I would rather miss that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is a saying which I love, uh, uh, don't pray for an easy life, pray to be strong. <laughs> uh, that has a lot of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> and you turn out uh, really excellent organist and uh, well respected in, in your field and you're traveling the world with not only recitals but also sitting in the competitions as a juror. So I think uh, those initial hardships uh, paid off. <laughs> Yeah, I must say, in my work as a teacher, I found, to my own surprise, that 90% of the work is the same as in a chemistry laboratory. Uh -huh. Because in my physical chemistry laboratory, I knew from theory, something must work. It didn't work. So I had to find out which screws to turn for the thing I knew that should work to make it work. It's the very same approach. I know I am able to play something. Others are able to play something. My student is not yet able to play that. Which screws do I have to find? Which screws do I have to turn so that he can play it? Of course, the, the screws are different in a scientific setting and in the setting of uh, teaching a human student. But uh, also in science, the material constantly changes. So basically what you are doing, the way of thinking, is the same in scientific work and in teaching to do something what you know should work. Of course, the last 10% are then the inspiration that is different in science and, and music. That's then the material with which you work. Wonderful. Uh, Professor Zander, uh, where could our listeners uh, find out more about you and your work? Could you direct uh, our organists and listeners uh, to your website, for example? My website is very easy. Uh, triple W, Martin Zander in one word and then .de for Germany. Excellent. And Martin Zander is M-A-R-T-I-N. Zander is uh, S-A-N-D-E-R, mm. right? Not and Z. Not Z. But, <laughs> yes, yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. And uh, I hope you will have much fun judging the contestants in the final round. I'm sure we will have. Thank you very much. This blog is supported by Total Organist, the most comprehensive organ training program online, where you will find courses for every area of organ playing, including technique, practice, sight reading, repertoire playing, hymn playing, improvisation, composition, music theory and harmony, with hundreds of scores and thousands of exercises. Here is what some of the students are saying. Who writes? The sight reading course has helped me tremendously. Thank you very much for your SS courses and all your help. Robert writes, I found the fingerings, registration ideas and general comments to be excellent. John writes, I have found your download very helpful. It was really excellent. I have watched some of your teaching videos and when I read your instructions. I try to imagine you are there teaching me. You may feel disappointed that I am two three days behind, but I am a slow learner, and I have committed to taking the time to get it right as you say. But the other night my wife commented that she had never heard me play such a detailed melody in the left hand so well. My left hand is generally poor. Robert writes, It has been a great pleasure in my life of having discovered your courses and material as well as the YouTube work of recordings. You have a calm and pleasant way of teaching. Ron writes, Hi Vida Santosha, thank you guys. What a wonderful response to my email note to you. You've got me right, and I feel you understand my level of playing. Yes, at home and lucky that I have an organ for that reason. 
I am paying attention to this and I am going to try this haha no longer secret model. Yes, and I love Caesar Frank too. What is very nice about your blog podcast is that Osha and Vidas are like a Socratic dialogue and by bouncing things off of each other, so much more information comes out and is expressed. Your comments contain a wealth of information and understanding. I really appreciate this. It is very inspiring and will keep us moving forward. Would you like to receive the same or even better results that our students are getting? If so, join them at organduo.lt slash total dash organist. And of course, you will get the first month free too. You can cancel anytime. Also, if you haven't yet subscribed to receive free updates of this blog, make sure you do that at organduo.lt. By subscribing, you will also receive free video How to Master Any Organ Composition and 10-Day Organ Playing Mini Course. This was Vidas and Osha from Secrets of Organ Playing. And remember, when you practice, miracles happen.